nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the recitation on semiconductor devices. Uh, my name is Gerhard Klimek. Um, we'll uh, walk through NanoHub a little bit and I'll show you some of the tools in our semiconductor workforce development area. So here is uh, NanoHub, it's our website. Um, what we'd like to encourage is uh, people to use modeling and simulation and we host uh, uh, many, i.e. over 500 apps and tools on NanoHub that in, uh, stem from research. And what we want to do is making make data and simulations more pervasive. We want to do that also by enable to uh, learn and teach, um, for uh, students to learn and for faculty to teach with these tools. And I'll uh, show a bunch of demos here today. Uh, in the process of getting things into NanoHub, you may want to develop software, develop your own research software, or deploy tools in, in NanoHub, which you then ultimately publish and share. So that's really the, the overall mantra that we're pursuing. Uh, with a renewed interest in semiconductors, we created a, a landing page for semiconductor workforce development. And if you um, click on the, any, anywhere here, you'll go to a, a page here that is dedicated to resources for semiconductor workforce development. So here is a uh, an overview of tools. So we have a, a several tools that I like to demo that enable immersive learning. We have a, a courses here, uh, open courseware. So we're massively online uh, open courseware, uh, reaching from fundamentals of semiconductors uh, over to thermal transport and nanoscale energy transport. So quite a variety of two, uh, of uh, courses that are available. Uh, we also have uh, free textbooks that run with a couple of these uh, courses. I mentioned we have uh, uh, a lot of apps that are also dealing in electronics and materials. We also have tools that require more expertise. So we, you have to be, be more than uh, an app user. Uh, we're engaging with commercial software vendors. We now have MATLAB and Thermocalc on the site, and we'll have Silvaco tools uh, coming in soon. We are partnering with various efforts in the United States. And uh, the recitation series that we have run last December to January is actually recorded here uh, as ongoing faculty engagements. We also have uh, 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 course materials that are dedicated to just faculty by themselves. So if I now uh, go back here and I want to look at the semiconductor device uh, fundamentals, so this is our tool suite abacus that we created to really uh, enable teaching of semiconductors in um, through modeling and simulation. So here you see crystal structures, band structure models. I'll be talking about bulk semiconductors today. Uh, in the next sessions, we'll talk about PN junctions and MOS capacitors, MOSFETs, bipolar junction transistors. So basically, Abacus is an assembly of different tools. And this is actually the group page that accumulates that material. There's a navigation here on the left. Uh, so here we can deal with crystals, uh, band structure models that were discussed uh, in the last session, and uh, PN junctions to get you an idea uh, as well. And uh, we'll be talking about bulk semiconductors today, where there is a, a, a lab where you can explore carrier statistics. And I'll focus uh, quite a bit today on this drift diffusion lab in Abacus. So if I click on here, what this does, it, it actually gets us to the tool. And uh, each tool on NanoHub is actually a publication. It has a DOI. It is now listed. These tools are now listed in the Web of Science as a proper publication. And uh, if you hit launch tool, it'll say that you must log in. And um, you can uh, log in with uh, uh, in common logins. So if your university is listed here, uh, you can also um, enter. Um, uh, so you go, go through these, these listings here. You can sign in with Google and create an account this way, or you can create your NanoHub account. So we really want to encourage everybody 
uh, who's listening in to, to create an account. Uh, so you can actually walk along uh, with the um, with the demo. So uh, here's again the NanoUp homepage. I clicked on the workforce development item. I click on semiconductor device fundamentals, and I go to the Abacus uh, group page. I uh, click on the tool suite. I get to the publication, and now I, I am logged in in this window. I can launch a tool. So what is happening now? Uh, a remote uh, machine is getting engaged. It's displaying its uh, output on the screen here. I'm going to rescale it slightly so it fit, fits better onto the screen here. So here is uh, Abacus, and uh, this is, say, the, the splash screen of it. Um, there's a bunch of tools that are basically embedded into a sort of a mothership of a tool. Um, you can reach any of these tools individually, also in NanoHub, so they are available. It's not like uh, you have to use them with an abacus, but this is really a one-stop shop. You can also see the list here uh, explicitly. That is the same. These are the same items that are depicted graphically. And um, I want to look today at Drift Diffusion Lab as a prime focus. So what you saw uh, pop up here is uh, two tabs. And there's actually a, a tab here that includes homework assignments as well, and we can go over those. These are uh, really geared towards using this specific tool and giving in, uh, questions that you can hand to your students. This is what's being used or had been used in um, Purdue, the undergraduate graduate version of semiconductor devices, two assignments and one from Dragica Vasileska at Arizona State. So. Drift Diffusion Lab, let's go in here. So this is a, uh, a, a typical thing that uh, you might do in a semiconductor class. You're, you're looking at a, a semiconductor slab that is in one dimension that you can calculate analytical expressions. So what this is, is a, a, a one up on, on the analytical expression. It's actually running a, an honest to goodness industrial strength tool called Padre that uh, was originally developed at Bell Labs, and it was donated to us uh, uh, quite a while ago. So this is actually an old Fortran code, if you will, but it's an industrial strength code that actually designed transistors. And this kind of code would be hard to operate, and in many ways it's similar to commercial codes that you can purchase today. And what we've done is really create an app around this. So the experiments you can run here are you can apply a bias to a semiconductor and uh, look at, uh, uh, well, let me go through the models of what you can do. So you can um, uh, apply a bias, you can shine light on top. So that would be one thing that you can uh, in, do analytically in your class. And you can uh, shine from the left edge and say, see how the carriers diffuse from one end to the other. Uh, and then you could combine this by shining light and applying a voltage and shining light and from the edge and applying a voltage. So these things uh, with the voltage and the light combined might be actually kind of hard to calculate uh, analytically. And um, that's why you might have to use a full-fledged tool. Now, the structure we have here, it's a, uh, you can click on here, and this is uh, selected to be 0.5 micron long. So you can change that. You can look at intrinsic N-type or P-type uh, uh, devices, and you can solve for ambipolar electrons and holes only. So let's leave that all on the default for now. And uh, you can have a choice of materials and modify uh, the behavior. So here there's silicon, gallium arsenide, uh, germanium, and uh, you can uh, work on the lifetimes of these tools. And here is uh, also a way of modifying the mobility of these materials. For argument's sake, what I like to do is, because it makes life a little bit easier in the interpretation, I'm going to change the mobility of these uh, N-type and P-type to be the same. Um, and I'll, I'll undo this uh, later when we uh, uh, go into more detail. I know in the in the environment, I can um, uh, change the temperature, I can change the sweep voltage, I can change the number of bias points, 
And if I'm shining light on the structure, I can here change the um, the intensity of the light, the carrier generation rate, etc. And uh, some more details can also be modified, like uh, the recombination rates for electrons and holes um, on the left and the right contact, etc. So there's a, a lot of things that can be done that really drive a realistic device simulation. So now let me go in and uh, change the experiment that I run and just shining light from the top. All right, so uh, the structure is 0.5 micron long. And now I get to choose uh, in what uh, areas I want to shine light on it. So by default, it's um, um, lit up um, for 3 microns, 0.3 microns. I'm going to make the area a little bit um, smaller. So I really, you can think of this as a slit. Uh, that is exposing light here in the, more or less the center of the device, in the center of the device. This whole thing is 0.5 long, and I'm hitting it uh, uh, with, let me reduce the intensity. Well, it's, well, let me reduce the in intensity a little bit. And um, I leave all the other parameters the same. So the materials are the same, except I made electrons and holes the same. And I'm going to hit simulate. So what this is doing now, it's actually creating an input tag to this Padre tool, and it's running the uh, the simulation. And there we go. It ran uh, the IV characteristics, and now it's assembling uh, the input tags uh, and the output. And what you see here is uh, the bandage diagram. And that doesn't look all that exciting. It really runs looks more interesting and uh, non-equilibrium, et cetera. So, but let me look at the electron uh, uh, doping, electron density, and hole density as we are shining li light on this. And what you see here is, uh, I have to zoom in a little bit, that um, electrons and holes are being uh, created here in the middle of the device, and then they decay out into the contacts. Um, at the uh, contact on the left and the right, we have sur surface recombination. So we basically reach the intrinsic carrier density. And uh, that is kind of what you expect, right? In this region from 0.2 to 0.3, we're injecting carriers, we're generating carriers, and they diffuse out um, to the contacts. Now, what we can do is actually ch go in and change the minority carrier lifetime. So here, um, you can see this roughly linear behavior. That means the diffusion length m must be relatively large compared to the length of the device. But what if I in introduce so many um, recombination centers that my lifetime is really short? So let me do that. So now I made the lifetime really short, and I would expect much more recombination in in the segments where um, the carriers are diffusing. So again, this this is running the IV. And uh, now we can compare the um, doping and electron density. Zoom in like this. And clearly you see how um, just see a little blip here on the the electron density and the hole density that are actually on top of each other and you see a strong decay so now let me um go in and hit the uh system harder with light so i'm going to hit it with one uh, two e 20 and you should see more carriers being generated in the device and there should be this exponential decay because our lifetime is really short. So you really see um, the either the, the uh, diffusion limited um, uh, diffusion of the carriers, or here is the okay. So here we are generating way more carriers than before. I can actually compare the the two. So here you can see this is under. Um, the 2E19 excitation, here is the 2E20 excitation. So let me crank this up to 21 and run this again. 
So you really are, are creating way more, uh, significantly more carriers in the middle. And as we create more carriers, we should also create an imbalance in the Fermi levels. And that is what you see here. There's actually uh, a quasi Fermi level for the electrons and holes that is not just intrinsic in the middle of the gap anymore. And here you can now clearly see how we create more and more carriers. I'll go down here. All right, so this is what we kind of expect. If we now go back and modify the structure such that um, we have the original uh, microsecond, more typical minority carrier lifetimes, we should see uh, something interesting again happening here. The decay rate should be different because now the carriers can diffuse much further and therefore they don't recombine as fa and they don't recombine as fast in the semiconductor and therefore uh, the currents should be larger and I should um, that we can generate with this kind of uh, illumination as of now we're not sweeping the carriers out so there's no uh, uh, current calculation uh, performed here so let me so here again uh, now that we um, have um, uh, much uh, longer lifetimes. You can see how the carrier density is on on the on a log scale here um, is decaying. Uh, it's this is a linear scale. Sorry, is decaying linearly, and this was the original case where we have um, uh, high excitation but um, rapid carrier decay. All right, so we we kind of get a feeling for uh, what happens to carrier distributions. Uh, uh, when we have different lifetimes and uh, different um, uh, uh, intensities of illumination. So let me clear these results. And I'm going to go in and run a slightly different experiment. So now I'm going to uh, do the same thing as shining light in the middle, but I'm also going to apply a voltage sweep. So again, the structure is uh, the same. I'm going to look at um, silicon. Uh, microseconds. Uh, I do leave the uh, electrons and hole mobilities to be the same. I'm going to sweep uh, the voltage now and I leave the excitation uh, relatively high. So, well, actually, let me start from low again. I'm, and I'm not going to touch uh, the surface recombination and I'm going to hit simulate. So, we have relatively low excitation, uh, we have uh, long lifetimes. And uh, we are now calculating the IV um, with 21 bias points. This just ran pretty fast. And now it's assembling the results. So again, under the hood, this is really running a full-fledged tool. So here um, you see the IV characteristic. Um, as you um, apply a voltage, these carriers are going to be swept to the contacts. So. The energy band diagram looks like this. So you do apply a voltage like this. And now let's look at the carrier distribution. So we had looked at doping electron and hole density. So this look, looks familiar to you already. So there's two curves underneath each other. So now uh, we're applying a voltage and you can see that the electrons are being swept to the left and the holes are being swept to the right. And uh, what that means is in this little graph here that we have to change, we need to change this um, this icon, the battery direction. So uh, uh, thank you, Tanya. You had uh, found that last week when you uh, reviewed this. So we, we need to change this, uh, this image here slightly. Um, and you see the electron and hole distributions uh, basically differ from each other as the carriers are generated here in the middle and they're being swept to the left and the right. All right, so that's kind of what you expect. And now if you increase the light, you generate more carriers. Remember, this is an intrinsic slab. So any of the carriers that really that are flowing are being generated by the light. Um, otherwise, the overall current would be relatively small. 
because it's a it's it's an undoped semiconductor. And again, we're assembling the input deck. It ran it, and here we go. Now we uh, can look at the or well, here's the IV characteristic. We generate more carriers, and uh, therefore we also generate more current, and that's uh, visible up here. Let me let me go in here and now look at the uh, again the doping electron density, etc. And now you see we generated more carriers, and uh, they are diffusing. Uh, I guess. Uh, the slopes are different compared to the to this case here, where you, where you see a, a slightly different slope in the carrier distributions. Now let me let me hit the system much harder. Hit simulate and uh, look at the carrier distributions there and there. We should see uh, a bit of. Um, Uh, further difference in the in the charge distributions in the device. Right, that's assembling it. Okay, so we hit the system harder. Um, we have way more current flowing. Um, you can look at the electron density again. So again, we have a, a significantly higher generation that exceeds the. Um, the intrinsic carrier rate quite a bit. So here we are barely going above the intrinsic uh, carrier rate um, anyway. So that's why the current is relatively small. Now we're cranking this up quite a bit more. So there should be way more current flowing. And now we can um, we can now compare these. And you can really see nicely how the electrons are flowing to the left and they're way above the intrinsic carrier density and the holes are flowing to the right. And at, at this bias of 0.3, you can really tell that all of the carriers now, pretty much not all of them, but uh, most of the carriers really on the electron side flow to the left and the holes flow to the right. There is a, a, a little chat question I saw. Mm -hmm. What is the reason behind the swifting of charge carriers from the mid when voltage increases? I'm not sure I know the word swifting, but I, I think maybe it's shifting. So, so under under without bias, there's no preference for the carriers to either flow left or right. They just you inject them here, and electrons and holes are diffusing back out to the contacts. Um, the diffusion length is large, so this is a linear behavior. Now with a small bias. There will be a preference for electrons to go to one side and holes to go to, to the other side. Yes, the mobilities are the same. Um, so, uh, oh, the asymmetry. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not totally sure why there isn't asymmetry given that uh, the. Um, uh, the two mobilities are the same. Maybe there's another factor that is not really clearly exposed. Um, certainly here, here's my point of sweeping the uh, electrons into one direction and the holes into the other direction. You can see it from the band diagram. One thing that I wanted to show, right, I see the comment. The comment says, I think the mobilities are not the same. So that is in, indeed um, why I originally did this. So this was at 1450 and this, no, 1400, I think, doesn't matter. And this was at 450. And if you indeed make the mobilities, uh, ooh, ah, I didn't want it. Okay, this is fine. I could have just clicked the on uh, to the other direction to to have it calculate the mobility uh, based off of these uh, coefficients. So here uh, now you actually will see that um, 
the electron and hole densities are indeed quite different and, and shifted asymmetrically. And that is uh, one discussion item I wanted to avoid originally, such that uh, I don't have additional confusion. But indeed, um, uh, by having different mobilities, you you uh, distort the distributions of the uh, the carriers in this um, in in this drift diffusion modeling. So uh, that is exactly where I was aiming for uh, in this presentation to ultimately change this back to an uh, to a generated or say data lookup for silicon mobilities that are related to also the uh, the carrier lifetimes. So we can compare that and it should roughly look the same as what I had here. So the, the IV looks virtually the same and the uh, charge distribution should uh, ballpark look the same. And you see clearly a, the asymmetry in the structure. Now, just for, for argument's sake, you can now make this experiment again and, and and kind of kill the mobility and uh, right. And I think this is the last experiment which I wanted to show. Number one, you you effectively linearize the curve of the IV characteristics, and you can see that then uh, again in the decay rates that you have with the carriers that they really decay rather rapidly. Uh, away uh, from the excitation region. So uh, that's roughly what I wanted to show in the tool. Um, I wanted to briefly highlight that there's another tool. It's a very simple tool where you can uh, look at Fermi distributions and you can dope the structure, say, uh, 1E17. Um, this is calculating just Fermi level and uh, Fermi distributions and carrier distributions. And you can look at Fermi functions, you can look at the electron and hole densities uh, as you crank up um, the, the, the Fermi levels uh, and the, the charge distributions. So it's a, it's a simple tool to, to let students lose on, on, on uh, Fermi functions and charge distributions in a semiconductor. So this is kind of preceding the, the drift diffusion lab. I just wanted to highlight that this tool also exists. So you can look at density of states as well. Um, and here's the, just the electron distribution. And if I crank up this doping further, obviously I should get more electrons and they should extend further into the conduction band. Here's just the Fermi function. And let me look at the electron density. And here are the two. There's some, oh, it's because it's mapped as a sweep. That's why. All right. So you can't, in this curve, you can't directly compare. All right. That's roughly what I wanted to show. I'll, I'll gladly entertain some, um, some questions. All right. And then one of the first questions we got, they asked, can you get the numerical data out of these tools? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So see this little uh, green button here? download button. So uh, here, this happens to be a, a sequence of curves, right? Um, so you can get this in two ways. You can get the comma separated values um, and download them. And this will give you uh, a, all of the data that is embedded in this little widget. You can also create an image of it. And uh, the image you can uh, format in different ways, PDF, PostScript, EPS. You can mess with the axis. Um, it's really um, geared towards publication uh, style uh, format. You can include, include legends, etc. So it's a pretty uh, uh, comprehensive um, um, uh, plotting. Uh, if you have, for example, an IV characteristic, uh, again, download, you can get the image or you can get the data. Uh, so here, if I click download, what it does, um, 
it pops up a, a screen so you can get to all these IVs that we had uh, calculated in this plot. Uh, if you just have one uh, data uh, curve, so to speak, then you get just one, one data file in there. So yes, you can get to all this data. All right, great. The next question, what is the absorption coefficient of the semiconductor material? Can you modify the generation rate throughout this lab? Um, in this tool, we just have a constant generation rate, and we have a spatial uh, region in which this constant generation rate exists. So, so in this, in the example that I've shown, I out of the length of 0.5 of this slab, I'm shining light from 0.2 to 0.3, so roughly in the middle. But this tool right now does not have a spatial, otherwise spatially varying generation rate. All right, and then we have another question. Is it possible to run a 2D simulation? Um, in Padre, yes. Uh, in uh, this app, no. So this is really geared towards uh, aiming towards the 1D calculations that typically are being done in the classroom. So as I pointed out here, uh, this is uh, uh, this is running Padre under the hood, and in the output log, you can kind of see what the input deck is that was being run. And this is truly a, a Padre language that was assembled in order to, to do this calculation. If you uh, wanted to do a full 2D simulation, uh, you can do that. You go to Nano Tools Padre. And in there, um, you, you have a full-fledged uh, tool where you would have to speak the Padre language. You can start from um, uh, some devices like your PN diode or MOSFET that are actually all similar to what we have in Abacus, uh, and you would have to modify it. So here it would be a PN diode example. This is still one dimensional. A MOSFET is two dimensional here, and it has meshing information, etc., and do, do, uh, X and Y domains, etc. But I don't have an input take of, say, a 2D slab like this uh, that I could easily share. All right. This is from the same person. I'm not sure if it might be part of a follow up. They said, What about saturation velocity? I'm not sure if that's turned on in this input deck here. What the what the the detailed physical models are. Let me look. Uh, and I don't. I, I have to admit I don't speak Padre, um, but I've seen briefly that you can you can set up models. Oh, this is for different biases. So here are the surface recombination rates that are being set. Silicon tiles here. So you can have different mobility models. Um, and so this has SRH turned on, uh, field mobility. I don't even know what CON mobility means. So, so uh, some mobility models are turned on here, and I'm not sure if they are they have a velocity dependent in it, dependence in it. That's kind of not my cup of tea. All right, I'm going to ask this person. I have two questions. I think they might be related. Why is the electron profile at zero bias different from the holes? And then, kind of to go along with that, in the case when the when the mobility and lifetime were the same for electrons and holes at zero bias, it looked like the profile was different. Is there an explanation for it? I was puzzled by this. I am puzzled by that too. Um, so here is this case where we have uh, the light, uh, the mobilities were the same, right? And um, generation was low. And let me look at what's being fed in the mobility. 
So the interesting thing is it still talks about this field mobility, con mobility, and I don't even know where it sets the, the mobility. I, I, I will look into this because this puzzles me as well. Where is the mobility actually being fed in into this input deck? So here are all these solvers for different voltages. And I, oh, here. So here it's over, uh, oh, that's mu, mu zero. I bet there, there must be some other uh, parameters here that really want all to turn off some of these uh, mobility models. I am not sure. I don't know why it, why it would come out differently. I mean, they're, they're slightly different, but if they're truly the same mobility. So my suspicion is that there's something else going on in here in these mobility models. All right, the next question is, with respect to whole, how is the relationship, if there's any, between light, heavy mass, and mobility? Yeah, as I said, I am not sure about these mobility models. The, the, this is what, I guess, the standard um, mobility models that are implemented in Padre. But I, I mean, we can look up uh, the Padre manual and look at the mobility models that are implemented. So um, that's a pretty detailed question. So tools, no, no, Padre manual. So here is the um, the manual we can uh, look up and walk through and look at the mobility models, but I don't think that's within the context right now. But we should we should look at it at some point, or I will look at it in the summer to try to figure out why is this mobility different. And I'm planning to modify this tool a little bit to start out with equal mobilities because it's easier to explain as a as a teaching tool and then dive into the complexities. All right, the next question is, can you shine the light sideways? Um, that's in this other experiment that I didn't uh, show. Um, sure, I should clear it all and just start a new one here. So here is this experiment where you can shine light from the edge. Uh, this is a 1D edge, right? So the depth is kind of meaningless. Um, and you just shine light in from one edge. So you can do that experiment, yes. And if I hit simulate, um, I didn't modify anything. So here's your IV. Let's look at um, electron doping density at non-equilibrium. So this is um, what you get out of this site. So you can do it. All right. The next question: Is there only silicon embedded, or we can, or can we change it to gallium arsenide or right right indium here. phosphide? I don't have. I don't think there's indium phosphide in here, but that can be easily added because I, I think it has it in its database. So what it has is gallium arsenide, germanium, and silicon. All right, uh, the next question, can you shine the light to both edges at the same time? Not in this model. I mean, you can in the tool in Padre by taking an input deck and modifying it accordingly, but not in this tool. I mean, if that's a feature you would like to request, uh, let me show this. You can go up here in this tool, and in this about this tool, you can click on it, and you get to the original tool, and you can you can add a wish here um, that we can uh, incorporate. So I can I, I'll add my wish to it, add indium phosphide to the list and modify the inputs to have equal mobility. So. I think that's what I want to do in the summer. It doesn't take a whole lot of time, but it takes time. So, I mean, the, the question I have for you that uh, asked the question, can you shine in light from both edges? 
uh, how highly interested are you in that? And would you have a homework assignment or a like that you would like your students to explore? So if you have something like that, I can probably modify the code uh, to shine light in from both edges. That wouldn't be a very hard thing to do. It's just I need the, the impetus too. We have a follow up to what you just asked. They said, I actually teach this example, so it would be useful to show numerically. All right. Can in you class. send me your, yeah, yeah, can you can you show me your, or share your homework assignment with us or with me? And then we can we have this page where we assign the uh, well, we can add a homework assignment like this in here. And um, we also I didn't highlight that we also have A, pay, a page that is dedicated to faculty only. So here's a faculty only group in which we can share homework assignments and also uh, homework uh, solutions. So this would be uh, only accessible to a limited number of people that identified themselves as faculty members. So this page is not open to everybody. It's, it's visible, but it's restricted. Uh, a few more questions coming in. The next question, when the light shines on both edges, the electrons and holes should swift towards center. I may be wrong. They said swift means diffuse. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so certainly under, without bias, you can just intuitively say, well, you generate carriers on, um, on the edges. There will be surface recombination at the edge, but nevertheless, there will be some diffusion to the middle of the device. So you, you can certainly uh, expect that, right? And you, we can, we can easily play with that if we go in here, just even for one side, we go from one edge only. Let me clear this out. So, so if I just shine a light from one edge, I would expect uh, carrier diffusion, right? Um, to 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 happen, right? Right there, it is, right. So this is from one edge, um, and this is again where mobilities are different for electrons and holes. All right, and they said, but what happens when the voltage increases? So this is without voltage. So let me uh, do this, and now increase uh, the voltage like this. I'm just going to go with defaults and don't do anything. Uh, what I would expect is that holes will go to one side, the electrons will go to the other side. So so let's zoom in here. Actually, the excitation is extremely low. Let me clear this and crank up. Oh, let me crank up the excitation a little bit more. Uh, so here's this penetration depth from from the left. So um, that's what I was wondering. So so how deep do, uh, do the electrons, uh, the photons penetrate until they're being um, absorbed? Or what that really means is, if you think of it, um, there's a, going to be a slab that's 0.1 micron um, thin, so very thin, in which electrons are being uh, uh, electron hole pairs are being generated. So let me 0.6 volt is pretty pretty high too. Okay, the symbol here is the IV, and let me zoom in. Oh, and the amplitude is low because the area is so, I mean, the, the injection depth is so, so shallow. So if you now, interesting, so if for the, even the smallest of bias, you, you can see that the, you sweep the electrons immediately to the left and the, the holes are being swept to the right. So it actually, the curve doesn't decay. They, anything that is, uh, generated on one edge is being swept to the left. 
So one thing to try here is actually resolve this a little bit nicer. Say point one volt and do this in 11 steps. And I'm going to mess with it more. I'm going to inject it a little bit deeper. And let's see what happens. And the effect should be uh, a little nicer to be observed. So here's the IV. Here's the bandage diagram. So I'm applying a little bit of a voltage. And let's look at the uh, carry density. So here is without bias. So we're injecting harder. Um, holes and electrons under no bias diffuse to the right and the left and are recombining at the surface. And as we increase the voltage in smaller steps now, we can see that the electrons that are generated on the left are basically all making it to the left and the holes that are generated on the left all make it to the right. So they're being swept out to the right as you expect. I hope that that helps it. And I guess what you're saying is if we had left and right excitations, we sort of see a, sym a symmetry, right? Should that be? Yeah. I, I would actually, what I expect to see is electrons looking like holes on the other side. So it should be decaying and flat, and then the holes should be decaying and flat the other direction. That's what I kind of expect to see. But I haven't done it. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, they said thank you. And then the last question I see, for the side illumination, can you show again the electron and hole profile at zero bias? right here. And again, the mobilities are different. That is why electron and hole distributions are uh, different. If I go in and manually make these mobilities the same again, then these curves roughly should overlap with the caveat that we all already saw it. They didn't overlap perfectly. But if I go in like this, I might I made the mobility is the same, so at least at zero bias they should overlap. So again, here now we have the case of uh, mobility is the same, mobility is different. I can compare those, and overall qualitatively the curves then don't change uh, under bias. It's just the mobility. Um, effects are then the same on these carriers, left and right. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. I think that concludes all the questions we received. Awesome. So thank you very much.